It was a January morning in the Gulf of Mexico. I was miles off the coast of Louisiana and about 80 feet underwater. I was on the ocean floor wearing a giant yellow fiberglass dive helmet and a hot water suit to keep me warm. On the barge floating above me, where we lived and worked for weeks at a time, was everything that kept me alive underwater. Air, communications, and a pump that supplied heated water to the hoses in my suit as I worked. It's kind of like walking around in your own personal jacuzzi. That morning, my job was digging a long trench for a pipe underneath the oil rig. Water was sucked into a pump, then pushed with amazing pressure back down to a nozzle I was holding, blasting mud and silt away on the bottom of the seafloor. Sort of like a super soaker squirt gun on steroids. Doing this type of work, you have no visibility. So it was vital to make sure the trench you were digging was the right height. If you dig a deep hole or a tunnel, the chances of it collapsing on you are really high. And that can be really, really bad. I don't remember what I was thinking, but apparently it was not checking the height of the trench. When I finally did check, I realized the sides were well over my shoulders. I dug myself a hole. So two thoughts came to me at the exact same time. Number one, so this is how it happens. Number two, I was really bad at this job. I quickly tried to move backwards, hoping the walls didn't collapse in on me. I informed topside of my stupid mistake and heard over the comms in my helmet that they would be bringing me up to the surface. And instantly I calmed down. I felt my feet coming off the seafloor as the team on the surface pulled me to the barge. Commercial divers don't really swim. We just sink. So when it's time to go back to the surface, you get an elevator ride all the way to the top. Once I was back on the surface of the barge, I was stripped down and crawled into the decompression chamber where I would spend the next few hours under pressure to help me avoid decompression sickness. I was a commercial diver medic and the lowest on the totem pole of divers, I was a tender. So the majority of my time, especially offshore, was working with these chambers and divers to avoid the bends. But today, I was the one in the steel tube thinking about my dumb mistake I had just made. And I remember there's only one question pounding in my head. And it's probably the exact same question that right at this moment, possibly as I'm giving this talk, you, the students of Westridge, Seniors, juniors, perhaps even a few sophomores, and absolutely, certainly your parents are most likely thinking about, focusing on, maybe even obsessing over. What am I going to do with my life? For you, the question probably sounds more like, where am I going to college? This question probably controls the classes you take, the studying you do, what activities you are involved in, and how you spend your free time if you have any. It probably feels like every conversation around your house includes some question regarding testing, applications, virtual tours, essays, and where you want to go for the next four years of your life. It must be an overwhelming and crazy feeling, both exciting and terrifying at the same time, especially now in the middle of a global pandemic. We've always been taught that our career, our life, or success starts with college, with the school we choose. Allow me to take a little pressure off of you for just a moment. Apple, Ford, WhatsApp, Disney, Tumblr, Mashable, Facebook, Twitter, Virgin, and hundreds of other smaller companies, including my own. What do they have in common? Not one, not one of them was started by a college graduate. Does that mean college isn't important or helpful? Absolutely not. However, it's not the only pathway to success in life. It's a tool. It's a tool you collect in your personal toolbox. Every experience, every unique aspect and skill you experience or acquire in life, every mistake, even digging yourself into a hole, makes up this imaginary toolbox. And you learn how to use these tools in ways that helps you be successful. This eclectic collection of skills is what makes the way you do things unique. These tools are what you will use to solve challenges, fix situations, and find your purpose in life. It also is what sets you apart from everyone else. But purpose, purpose is a scary word. It means finding and pursuing something bigger than you, something that'll have an impact on the world and truly gives your work meaning. Trying to find that purpose, that direction, when everything interests you, when there are so many things to learn about and pursue, when you're as smart and capable as all the students at Westridge are, how do you choose? How do you choose which direction to follow? 
You may turn to teachers, family, friends for advice on what to do, what major to pursue, what career you should focus on. And I'm certain you've received a lot of unsolicited advice. Maybe you've heard, what do you like? What do you love? What are you passionate about? The follow-up is often, then you should pursue that. That should be your major. Maybe you should do that for a job. I think you should be a lawyer, so just go to Harvard. See, problem solved. Although this is all well-meaning advice, I believe it misses the mark. What you like, what you love will change with time. As you grow and evolve, your tastes and your interests do as well. What you like and enjoy now is most likely a far cry from what you liked and enjoyed five years ago or even a month ago. So how do you determine what you should do? How do you figure out that elusive major, that job, that career path? What it is going, that's going to give you purpose? Rather than looking for what you like or what you love, I feel the answer is to ask yourself, what do I hate? Now, I don't mean that you hate Visco or Facebook or bad tacos. I mean, what do you fundamentally feel is wrong in this world? What is unjust? What is unfair? What needs to be changed? What needs to be better? What do you, with your unique set of tools, need to do something about? The question then is, what do I hate? And what am I going to do about it? As I was laying in that cold chamber back on the deck of that ship in Louisiana, one answer came through clearly. At that moment, I hated not being with my dad. My dad had been diagnosed with terminal cancer. They found nine tumors on his brain and gave him about six months to live. My dad was a fighter, Irish and ornery, and chose to go down swinging. Surgeries, radiation, experimental drugs, he was willing to try anything. My younger brothers, mom, and even grandmother were carrying the load of getting him to his appointments and therapies back home. But as I sat in this steel chamber, not being there for him was what I hated. It was that moment I chose to do something about it. Within two weeks, I was back in California. And I had time to take my dad to some of his appointments. Those appointments quickly became something that I dreaded. I was angry. Every doctor's office seemed to have less respect for my dad and the other people in their lobby than the next. He was referred to as cancer guy, room two or worse, and my favorite face guy. After a brain surgery, my dad had suffered Bell's palsy, a paralysis of the muscles in his face, which caused one side to look like it was sliding off. He had to deal with that every single day on top of a dozen other issues that the cancer caused. He didn't deserve to be labeled by it. That one comment, that was the final straw for me. That disrespect, the disdain, the lack of empathy, the lack of understanding or compassion pushed my anger and my frustration over the line until it became a deep-seated hate. A hate for what seemed to be the standard way patients, even those battling the, for their lives, were treated. These people and their families needed so much more support. And in the middle of the most difficult moments, there was none to be found. I had no idea what I could possibly do about it. I was just a diver medic. But I knew I had found what I hated. And I knew that I would figure out some way to have an impact. Later that year, I was approached by a group that planned to build one of the first privately owned hyperbaric centers in California. Hyperbaric chambers were medical versions of decompression chambers that had proven to help heal wounds, burns, and treat side effects of radiation therapy. They needed someone who knew about decompression chambers and oxygen systems to both help build the center and run the center. Turned out, I had the right tools for the job. I had absolutely no idea how to build a clinical hyperbaric center, but I did know that I could figure it out. And I also knew that this was my opportunity to do something about what I hated. It took us over six months to build the center. And unfortunately, just two days before we opened, my father passed away. A lot of my time with my dad in his last few days was spent talking about this project and telling him how excited I was to treat these patients. I dealt with the loss of my dad by focusing on every patient we saw in our center. I still remember the very first patient we treated vividly, Bessie. We were able to reduce Bessie's pain and heal a wound that she had had for over two years. She told me directly that we changed her life. How powerful is that? As I ran the chambers at the center every day, I came to find something I hated even more than the disrespect that drove me to the medical industry in the first place. 
the pain and suffering that was caused by non-healing wounds. I met dozens of patients that had their feet and legs amputated due to diabetic wounds. And the tragedy was that so many of these amputations were completely avoidable if we could just get them into our center and possibly into a hyperbaric chamber. I learned that over half of the amputees will die within five years or less. And every 30 seconds, an amputation is performed on a diabetic patient. It was simple. If we could save a limb, we could possibly save a life. Over the next few years, I learned everything I could about my new profession. Just because you don't go to college doesn't mean you get to stop learning. I also lost my way for a while. I founded a business with three partners in Beverly Hills to treat cosmetic surgery patients in hyperbaric chambers. I liked that we could help them heal faster. I liked meeting celebrities. I liked telling people I owned a business, and honestly, I liked feeling important. But I need to tell you, over five years, that all faded, and I realized I was no longer doing anything about what I hated. I sold my shares in the company to my partner and went back to wound care. In 2002, I found a wound care advantage. Every day, the amazing team I have the honor to work with impacts the lives of thousands of patients in dozens of states around the country. In each center, we reduce amputations and improve lives. Every patient is treated with the respect and compassion I wanted from my dad. That gives me a reason to go to work every day, even on the bad ones. An uneducated knucklehead diver like me can build a medical company. Imagine what you can do. So as you, the unique, talented, and well-educated students of Westridge stand at the starting line, I challenge you not to accept other people's definitions of success or where you should go. I challenge you to build your own toolbox. Make mistakes. Look for what is wrong, what is unjust, what is unfair, what needs to be changed. I challenge you to find what you hate. And then I have just one question for you. What are you going to do about it? Thank you.